Hi, everyone. I'm Rachel Sandberg. As we just observed in Ethics Part 1, to answer some of our questions about whether and how to protect sensitive but not private content, we have to dig into the research consent framework a bit. Let's imagine that our TVM researchers want to feel like they're doing the right thing by obtaining consent from the creators of the text and data mining content that they're using. And let's also imagine that our TDM researchers are in luck because they're mining data from a platform like Twitter, through which content creators have already expressly consented to their content being used downstream, merely by using the site. As Vaina and others found in 2016, even if consent is given for reuse in terms of service for a social media site, because the details are often buried in lengthy terms of service, Users are likely unaware that they have consented to human subjects research through their use of a mobile or social networking platform alone. For instance, Twitter's terms of service here permit individuals to distribute, retweet, promote, or republish tweets on other media sites and services. Users' reliance on terms of service that are vague, complex, and subject to modification without notice leaves them with an incomplete understanding of how their personal information will be used and shared, and arguably falls short of the informed consent requirements intended by research ethics and regulatory frameworks that were developed for clinical research. According to some legal scholars like Crawford and Schultz in 2014, this also raises procedural due process considerations. They reason that by definition, some uses, including the retention of data for longer than originally envisioned, such as for purposes of a newly emergent use, may be unforeseen at the time of collection. So how can it actually be considered consent, and thus how can due process have been served, if one cannot have even conceived of the yet-to-be-determined queries that might be run when people are relying on their personal data? This is the very reason some scholars are moving away from this consent-based research paradigm, which emerged in the 1970s, to a harms-based paradigm. Another reason scholars are advocating for a move from a consent framework to one based on treating harm is because a consent-based regulatory framework for human subjects research is not conducive to TDM. The current regulatory framework is based off of the common rule which provides protections for clinical human subjects research and was heavily influenced by the Belmont Report, written in 1979 by the National Commission for the Protection of Human Subjects of Biomedical and Behavioral Research. The Belmont Report outlines the basic ethical principles in research involving human subjects. In 1981, with this report as foundational background, Health and Human Services and the Food and Drug Administration revised and made as compatible as possible under their respective statutory authorities, their existing human subjects regulations. The common rule is implemented in Title 45 of the Code of Federal Regulations pertaining to public welfare. For all participating federal departments and agencies, the common rule outlines the basic provisions around informed consent and assurances of compliance that are subsequently implemented by institutional review boards, or IRBs. Human subject research conducted or supported by each federal department or agency also needs to conform to additional regulations of that department or agency. The general problem is that the common rule, which requires obtaining informed consent, is often inapplicable to common TDM methodology. Typical human subjects research must go through IRB, but many text and data mining studies in the humanities fall outside the common rule's reach because there's no direct interaction with subjects or the research doesn't involve subjects' private identifiable information. In these cases, institutions are not required to oversee the research at all, even if, as you may feel, there are ethical considerations. Let's get even more specific about why the common rule and informed consent framework creates gaps in research oversight. What qualifies as human subject research, and thus what is subject to purview of common rule and IRB review in turn, is perhaps too narrowly defined to, one, collecting research through an intervention or interaction, or two, identifiable private information. We often don't have either of those two conditions satisfied in text and data mining. Text and data mining doesn't trigger intervention or interaction because it doesn't necessarily occur with a particular subject. 
As to the second part of the definition related to identifiable private information, this may not be triggered because of what is considered private. De-identification can nominally render common rule and IRB inapplicable, but as has been shown, it's ineffective in, at times as a means of preserving privacy because a research data set that has been de-identified can in many cases be used in combination with other data to re-identify someone. Professional guidelines don't necessarily plug the gaps either. For instance, the British Psychological Association, along with the Association of Internet Researchers, recommends carefully considering ethical issues when using social media data, particularly regarding privacy, but the guidelines do not take an overt stance on the matter of whether consent for publication must be obtained. Even assuming text and data mining researchers want to apply common rule standards and gain informed consent, this isn't always feasible when the data collection is from inordinately large numbers of people. Obtaining consent may also not be feasible because of the very notion of authorship, which might not be aligned with the proposed use. As Kimberly Christen in 2018 explains, in Western settings and legal contexts, the author is seen as the sole creator of a work. In many indigenous communities, however, the notion of a single creator of a song or author of a narrative is undone by the value placed on community production, ancestral creation of stories, or other forms of cultural and artistic content. No one person can or would assert authorship or ownership of the materials. It may flow from this that no one person can give consent. So given what we know of the consent-based framework and the gaps in oversight it leaves for much of text and data mining research, how should we proceed with an ethical theory and practice? We'll begin to explore that in the next video.